Why do you work? Is it really just for money? High costs and lower buying power. Is it for purpose? This is the time to figure out is it for what is community? For dignity and Maybe it's just to keep busy. The question, why do you work, is a complicated one. At the most basic level, work provides a paycheck. But for many, money is table stakes. They want that and more. Over the years, people started to seek purpose in their work and demand more from their employers. COVID-19 was the fuel that's turned a spark into a fire. Now, people are quitting at record. A record-breaking 4.3 million Americans quit their jobs in August alone. Workers are going on strike. Job transitions have seen a 54% increase in 2021. Workers claim that these benefits are keeping Americans from going back to work. People they're putting work on trial. Employers bring in record record profits while they were putting their health, their lives on the line. Often this is like my fifth ticket during this pandemic. I find that deplorable. More prices for meats, poultry, fish, and eggs have risen more than 11%. Now that they make more money than they ever have, we feel like we should get some of that stuff back. Employees at this Nebraska Burger King telling customers, we all quit. I could not work for somebody that treats their employees that way any longer. Work is on trial in part because of economic injustice, but for the sake of scope... And keep it clean. Yeah. yeah no. This documentary's focus is on the human element of work. My purpose is what I'm doing now, is talking, baby, what you mean. <laughs> We're here to uncover why people work and why they choose to walk away. Now, people understand that the organization is a system that they operate in, and that system can either be detrimental to their overall livelihood, or it can actually support their health and well-being. Maybe we should start by addressing the elephant in the room. 2020 was a watershed year. It's a pandemic year. In a hundred years, when we look back at this moment, we are going to see it as the embryonic stage of the change in work. It exploded into this uh, moment of return of the power of the worker. The pandemic didn't start it. The pandemic simply accelerated that and made it into more of a movement because everybody was feeling the pressure at the same time. I lived in New York for 10 years and I got to live my Broadway dreams. I hit this really high point of my career. I got to play a dream role and originate it in this Broadway show called Honeymoon in Vegas. It's an original Broadway cast, meaning I'm not replacing somebody else. Like we get to be part of the opening night, we get reviewed by the New York Times. We were reviewed really well uh, by critics and I had this like huge solo that made everybody laugh and people were really starting to notice me and I thought, that that was it, that this was the beginning of me becoming a true star. We came in on Tuesday at 6 p.m. for like an all-company meeting, and they told us that we were closing that Sunday and that we were all losing our jobs. And then we had to do a show that night. So I did the whole show crying, and it's a comedy. And my fake eyelashes that were glued on were like falling off of my face because they were just covered in tears. <laughs> and I really believed in this show, not just because I was in it. Um, and that, that completely broke my heart. It like broke my trust in the industry and it just showed me really how uh, unrewarding it is. I'd always talked about going back to engineering, which was what I studied in college, if theater didn't work out. I wrote on Facebook, um, I'm thinking of going back to engineering. And that was it. Facebook led to coffee chats, which led to coding boot camp, which led Catherine to code her own projects and gain experience. Eventually, she landed a full-time engineering role at Stitch Fix, and it was completely empowering. I didn't need a director to be like, oh, I think you're the right part for this. You can go ahead and have this moment. Like, you create that moment for yourself with the power of like, coding and building things. Catherine loved this so much, she wanted to help other artists make the transition to engineering. So she built a community, Artists Who Code. 
It started off as a small community that was just our immediate friends who we texted that might be interested. And the, the group has now grown to 300 plus people. Catherine was able to choose the project she wanted to do, right? She's no longer being managed by someone exactly telling her exactly what she's gonna do, right? So many people are quitting their jobs. They have other opportunities. They can go watch YouTube videos and become specialized in something um, and it doesn't cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars, right? And so they can really become whoever they wanna become and they don't have to put up with organizations not caring about them. I started selling complex trading platforms in the city of London in 1998. So eight years doing pure sales and then the next 10 years I spent building out teams. But at the start of 2021, Wayne started evaluating his situation. He was spending 10 to 15 hours a week doing meaningful work and the rest in pointless meetings. What I was doing in those 10 to 15 hours a week, maybe I could provide this value to three or four companies at the same time. And the hourly rate that they'd pay me would add up to a lot more than what I was getting paid in my in my day job. So he quit his job to work for himself as a consultant. Turns out choosing his own thing was priceless. I went to a conference for four days, my first time going anywhere since the pandemic. And in that time, Oliver's grown from three years old to five years old. Um, and I've spent a lot of time with him. He, it was a really emotional moment going to the airport. Oh, I was, it was tough. Uh, and I might get upset even talking about it. He just wouldn't let go of my leg. And, and it was, I've never seen the look on his face be like that. I mean, it was a five-year-old boy that was just broken. I couldn't have formed that bond with him if I was going to and from the office every day. It just, it wouldn't have been possible. Time is our most precious commodity and time with our children is the most precious commodity within time. And I got some of that back uh, through choosing to do my own thing. When we think about something like time as a benefit, are we giving people the time to work on their lives as well as work in our organizations? I mean, this journey that we're going through through life is just one time we get to do it. And I think that uh, for workplaces, a part of the, the reckoning has to be making sure that these complex beings that you have in the workplace, you see them as human first and not just as laborers. My honest view is I think a lot less than 10% of companies really lean deeply into the, their employees. You know, people are a commodity. And that's what's nuts about so many companies is like ego gets in the way. I'm the boss. Well, you, you're kind of the boss, but actually without these people, you're completely useless. So are you really the boss or is it them as a collective that are the boss? When you come out of medical school, you don't really have a lot of understanding of the business world. And, and since we have four partners here, it's easy to kind of start to put our, ourselves into different lanes and, and build the culture from there. And at first, we started with a small practice. And almost 20 years later, we've got you know, many more employees. And so how do, you, how do we scale that? How do we get that same feeling of a small practice and yet serve everyone in a way that is core to our mission. I think that culture at Treehouse hit its lowest point a little bit before I started. There was a disconnect between the leadership across the board. It was definitely like growing pains. We went from less of that homey feel and more of like a corporate feel. You start noticing a lot of people leaving when we've never had turnover before. They, they asked for um, strategic planning, but after my first meeting with them, I knew that it was, um, that we really needed to solve the primary issue, which was their team dynamics within the partnership. Probably the biggest lesson Wendy taught us was actually figure out who you are as a person, figure out who you need to go to 
to kind of cover your weaknesses. The ability to be compassionate and understanding of others starts with your ability to be compassionate and understanding of yourself. And if you cannot be compassionate to yourself, to your own foibles, to your own mistakes, then it will be nearly impossible to do that with other people. Because we understood each other's strengths and weaknesses in our leadership team, that we were able to communicate effectively to our staff on how we were going to move forward. They sit down at tables and we, you know, we have dessert together and chat and they let them know where, where the office is going. It really showed me that they do, they do value us. They do want us to know that they're appreciated. About two weeks ago, uh, one of our employees had a flat tire outside after work. And I just happened to look outside and see a group of about 10 people um, sitting around her car, all employees. They got the tire fixed. Um, and to see how no one had to stay there. Everyone was off the clock. Uh, everyone was ready to go home after a hard day, but they stayed. That made me really feel good about, um, about what we can do as a team. I was 22 when I first started, and a lot of times, you know, me and the kids was the same size. I didn't feel safe in any capacity. Um, if there were fights, you were expected to help break it up, right? And I did not go to work to break up fights. I wore dresses and pencil skirts, and my hair was laid. Generally, when we measure safety, we're measuring in four areas of physical, emotional, intellectual, and psychological safety. So physical safety will be generally how we physically feel in the workplace, which is also being challenged by COVID-19 and people returning back from a remote, remote environment. Um, and then we have emotional safety, which we know some environments are emotionally expensive. I don't know if you've ever written an email that takes over an hour to write because you already know the person on the other side is gonna take it the wrong way. That's a, that's a lack of emotional safety. When it came to emotional safety, I was depressed. I would look out my window and cry. And I would try to keep my energy as upbeat as I could, but it felt like there was a boogeyman at the school, even just holding your bladder for the amount of hours, because there's no time, right? The class ends and the kids immediately start coming into your space. You don't have time until lunch. Then we have intellectual safety where people literally need to be able to logically see where things are going. And the psychological safety then is about how people see themselves as human beings and how that's impacted by decisions that are made inside the organization, including their own decisions. Psychological safety is what's also needed for innovation and for people to feel like they can take risk and do things that are outside of the norm and that they don't necessarily get punished for failure. It wasn't an environment where I could go and complain or have frustrations with my principal. Put it like this, I went to a, a professional development. I was sitting at a table, it's like my first year teaching, with teachers who have been teaching for 20 plus years. And we had both just started, they said, you should leave. And I was like, I should leave? It's like, teaching is not what it was when I first started. I would never tell anyone to stay in this profession and I've been in it for 20 plus years. You should leave. What's one thing they could have done to really make things better? Listen, care. Um, hearing administration say things like, well, we don't care about the teachers, we only care about the kids. That's unhealthy, that's toxic. You're telling me you don't care about me? Yeah, I mean, this is a really sad story, right? We had someone who was serving the next generation of people in this country to, you know, better their skills and the system that they were employed in drove them out. They were being asked to not care about themselves and their own needs, okay, that's, that's a huge problem. If you want teachers to perform well and you want teachers to be able to give to the students, you have to take care of your employees. You can't just say you don't matter because they, they won't have anything left to give. Today, LaShondra works for herself. She's an educational consultant. Um, I say time for money has been switched. I felt like I was giving so much time for minimal money. I make more um, in educational consulting, right? I know most teachers have multiple jobs. 
especially if they don't live in a two income household. So I would say one thing I got was time. And then I think really feeling like I was able to like express myself and not feel like I'm stuck in a box as a person, as a human, as a creative, and feeling like I could actually be in my purpose with my craft. My purpose is literally helping other individuals identify and get in tune with their purpose. It feels amazing. I got chills just thinking about it. OPS's journey started out with an idea that if we chose to focus on paying people more, we could have a service that was very non-traditional in the sense of our ability to meet expectations. By prioritizing our employees first, um, the end result is a service that they follow through on expectations. They're communicative. Um, they're willing to have conversations. They're willing to give feedback. But they're also willing to show up on time in uniform and actually give a shit. If you want to keep people, if you want to actually take care of them, you have to take into account a lot of different factors. It's taking the time to understand somebody's strengths and weaknesses and supporting them in both. Unless you ask the people that are out there doing the work what's important to them, uh, you're just taking a shot in the dark every single time. There's a sense of community in the company that is pretty important. Everyone is willing to make sacrifices for the whole thing. I think at the end of the day, as much as we want to separate our professional lives and our personal lives, they're so commingled, it's not, like you can't separate them. Especially with Zoom, you're literally opening up your home. Suddenly you're in that person's space, which used to be, you know, a very private thing. The idea that you don't take work home with you, I don't believe that. We want people to go home and be happy. We don't win unless our team's happy. The company's here to help them grow and seize them for who they are and we'll look out for them. Bring your problems to work. And I know that sounds insane, but no, bring your problems. Let us know what's going on. Let me help you so that inevitably we can get a better you showing up. There is a growing movement for um, uh, companies to recognize mental health is an important part of the equation. It's no longer okay to simply try to hide depression, anxiety, bipolar, whatever the thing may be. It is the responsibility of the company to recognize that it's a part of the equation and to support people to get the help they need. How does it feel to bring your full stop to work? It feels great and scary as hell. <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah. You know? And, oh my God, it's taken me a long time. And I'm really glad to see young people be able to do what it took me 50 years to do. They can do in a year or two years or three years or five years. There's a New York Times article that feels like a good ending to this. The piece said that now more than ever, Gen Z demands that work take care of the whole person. They're taking mental health days, managing up, and bringing the full spectrum of emotion into the workplace. But I think it's a grave mistake to call this a generational evolution. This is human evolution that's evident in these stories and most likely in your organization. And so the frustration is not just about money. We want more money as employees, we, but we want a fairer workload. We want to feel that we're supported. We want to feel like our decisions matter, that we're part of the decision making, that we have some agency in how we show up for work. And the pandemic has really forced us to rethink what matters. Is this job worth my life? 